the year was 1983, and Kenner was sweating. The Cincinnati, Ohio-based toy company had been made a market force thanks to its licensing of the phenomenally successful Star Wars brand, but with the third and final movie now out of theaters, it was time for something new. Unfortunately, the hot new thing had already been developed by their rival, Mattel Toys. Mattel's Masters of the Universe classic toy line had been embraced by kids for its exotic environments, larger-than-life characters, and exciting vehicles. In a sense, Mattel was eating Kenner's lunch and popping the bag using their exact same formula, but to greater effect. The fact that the syndicated show acted as a half-hour commercial for the line didn't help. Free advertising at a time when Saturday morning commercial spots were at a premium. Kenner needed something, and fast. And in walked DC Comics. Looking to return their characters to market after Mika lost the license in 1981, DC's intention was to feature their stable of superstars front and center to claw back the market share fellow publisher Marvel had eroded. They were won over by Kenner's presentation, which offered a superpower gimmick for every figure. Activated by squeezing the arms or legs, the toys could emulate the characters they were based on, allowing heroes to punch, block, and kick. Drawing upon DC Comics' own internal style guide, Kenner was able to beautifully emulate the work of master craftsmen like George Perez and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez to bring their 2D artwork to vivid life. There was even a color guide to make sure that Superman's PJs were on model. Bolstered by a series of eye-catching commercials featuring the toys in action, Kenner's Super Powers line enjoyed strong sales out of the gate, and the company issued three series of figures before abruptly ending the party in 1986. Join us now as we head back to sunnier times when fun fit in your pocket and every day was a new adventure. Figure number one in the line was, unsurprisingly, DC's flagship character, Superman. What, you were expecting Buona Beast? As far as setting the standard goes, we're off to a brilliant start. This is a bold and dynamic sculpt, solid but not overly boxy like a few later figures. Soups has a power action punch, strong enough to knock down any villain, along with a nicely manufactured cloth goods cape complete with S logo. Superman also comes with a 16 page mini comic and steely blue eyes guaranteed to stop any evildoer or girl reporter in their tracks. Batman makes the number two spot, sporting his classic blue and gray togs. Remember, this was five years before the movies washed all color out of the Cape Crusader's closet, so no black leather in sight. He has a power action bat punch, which seems kind of lazy. I mean, the first guy could punch. Give Bruce a batarang or bat rope to throw, or maybe kick flapping action. A stern skull balances the bright colors, keeping this dark night out of Super Friends territory. Taking up the rear of the Trinity is Wonder Woman in her modernized Bronze Age outfit. Armed with power action deflecting bracelets, a simple crossing of her elbows sends bullets harmlessly away from her and into nearby crowds. Hmm, wait a minute. The figure comes adorned with a sparkly length of gold thread that most kids lost instantly and a set of legs that ZZ Top could base an entire career renaissance on. One could argue that the head sculpt is suggestive of Linda Carter, but she looks a little more like Linda Lavin to these jaded eyes. The Flash streaks into the number four spot with his power action lightning legs, which is a jazzy way of saying squeeze his arms and his lower extremities flop about. But I kid, Barry's about to have enough problems without me putting the boot in. He's a nice bright red with a crisp lightning bolt tampo easily worn away by careless thumbs. And how about that expression? This guy's just happy to be here, even if the speed force has melted half his head. 
Now, onto the first villain of the wave, and it's Brainiac with his power action computer kick. And it's actually more brutal than it sounds, especially with those pointy steel toes of his. Much like Kenner's previous C-3PO figure, Brainiac features a vac metal paint job. The figure is notoriously prone to breakage due to the type of plastic used for the process, leaving kicking anything a distant memory for old Brainy. It's notable that several of DC's villains were more recognizable to the general public than its second-tier heroes, with the Penguin being a prime example. After all, Pengy had appeared alongside arch-foe Batman in the theater, the TV screen, and in the Mego toy line. Of course he'd be front and center here, only this time with a power-action umbrella to even the odds. This figure was re-released in 1992 when Kenner decided it was a more palatable option for their Batman Returns line than whatever the heck this was supposed to be. Good call. If the Penguin is in Gotham, then the Crown Prince of Crime can't be far behind. The Joker is looking sharp in his purple tux, complete with tails. This is a separate piece that attaches to the figure and is frequently missing from examples today. Mr. J features a manic-looking sculpt and a power-action madcap mallet ideal for either property damage or a quick and dirty disguise. Is this how Joker got away in that Batman Christmas jingle? Well, that's up to you to decide. In a return to the heroic side of things, Aquaman makes the number 8 spot with his power action deep sea kick. How is it different from Brainiac's power action computer kick? More splashing, mostly. Aquaman gets a lot of crap in pop culture, but as a kid, having a toy whose home was water made those trips to the beach or the pool that much more fun. The figure comes with a trident, presumably for protecting the Seven Seas and not catching his lunch. Charlie the Tuna can breathe a sigh of relief. For now, anyway. At number 9, it's Robin, the Boy Wonder. Although, he's looking pretty grown up here. Now this was right before the character made the jump to his Nightwing persona, and while his little shorts had changed, his power action karate chop had not. Like his cowed mentor, Robin comes with a cloth goods cape, which allows the character's red tunic to really pop. A nicely tampoed R symbol catches the eye, drawing attention away from the bloated head sculpt. Is he eating all the Twinkies DC and Hostess were shilling at the time? Have a salad, kid. You can't have Superman without Lex Luthor. Seriously. He makes the Joker look modest and underutilized in comparison. Lex comes in his green battle armor, which gets sillier the longer you look at it. Sadly, this is based on the comics version of the time, and not the filmic incarnation starring Gene Hackman, which would have been good for a French Connection custom figure. In the 11th spot is Green Lantern Hal Jordan with his Power Action Ring Thrust. Squeezing the figure's legs together brings his right arm up to simulate the wielding of his iconic power ring, one of the more effective gimmicks of the line. He also comes with a 16-page comic and his lantern battery molded in a bright green plastic. The figure has an exceptional head sculpt for the scale, a determined expression adding an air of gravitas to the whole affair. Saving the most striking design for last, Hawkman swoops into the final spot in the series. With his articulated flapping wings and Morning Star accessory, this figure succeeds in catching a child's eye whether they're familiar with the source material or not. I mean, what kid wouldn't want a winged badass to stomp their other figures into the ground? Now Hudson Hawk here actually commits the unforgivable sin of having a grimmer head sculpt than Batman, and that's with the little wings on the sides of his mask. With many of the biggest hitters out of the way, the focus of Series 2 turned to Darkseid and his evil minions. Created by comics legend Jack Kirby, DC actually paid the now elderly artist royalties for his work in producing the line helping the king make his way in later days. Collectors receive some of the most outlandish characters yet, giving the heroes of the first series a threat beyond battle-suited businessmen and Gotham gangsters. 
Darkseid was the first out of the gate at a towering five inches tall. His increased stature and power action raging motion left no hero or villain standing, but that wasn't all. The Lord of Apocalypse also came with a cloth goods cape, a 16-page comic detailing his evil exploits, and, most impressively, a light piping feature which allowed his eyes to simulate the dreaded Omega Beam effect. Skeletor had nothing on this figure. Next up, it's the tiny tyrant of terror, Desaad, armed with his power action shock squeeze, which is essentially a chest mounted defibrillator. An odd weapon of choice, but the vac metal engine bit set against the purple robe at least gives this second rider some visual appeal. His legs would later be reused for the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves line. Way to pay it forward. The commander of the Dog Cavalry, Steppenwolf, is a striking figure with his spiky outfit and porn star mustache. Hey, it was the style at the time. Consider yourself lucky they didn't give Aquaman a lip tickler. How creepy would that have been? He'd be like an undersea Owen Wilson. There's a thought that'll haunt you. Anyway, Steppenwolf here comes with a power action electro axe grip to hold his vibro axe. You know, as you'd expect. Stepping up for the heroes, it's John Jones, the Martian Manhunter. Unfortunately, representing John's more exotic powers like invisibility and shape changing is beyond the ability of mere plastic, so he just punches, like most everyone else. He is molded in an arresting green hue, which is set off nicely by some clean paint apps. He also gets a nice cloth good cape and a 16 page comic, although you have to provide the Oreo yourself. Perhaps the most enigmatic character in the line, Dr. Fate, has been around in one form or another since the 1940s, making him one of DC's oldest properties. Uniquely positioned as a magic user in a world of aliens and metahumans, the Doctor patrols the shadowy corners of the universe, dealing with threats outside of the norm. He has a cloth goods cape and one of the niftiest head sculpts in the line, then again, I've always been a sucker for helmet fins. Firestorm was a character DC was pushing hard in the mid-1980s. Like me, he was a kid from Pittsburgh, just trying to make his way in the world. Although my hair only burst into flame once or twice. His off-the-wall backstory and exotic power set seemed like a sure bet, but Firestorm never really graduated beyond C-list status and that was with his power action atomic punch. What's a guy gotta do? Well, ask Green Arrow, the effortlessly cool archer who's somehow a member of the Premier League of Superheroes in spite of showing up to the party with nothing but some pointed sticks. I think it's the beard. Chicks dig a beard. And being a billionaire doesn't hurt, naturally. Ollie comes with a lime green bow and a single arrow that was destined for a date with your mom's vacuum cleaner. If you still have yours, the figure is worth another Hamilton. Easy. Dim-witted henchman and son of Darkseid, Calabac, is up next. Dig his power action beta club swing, which is the talk of softball leagues three towns over. Now, I'm not one to judge, but if this is Darkseid's son, what the heck does his mom look like? The Lord of Apocalypse has some selective taste in the ladies. His mom is so ugly the doctor slapped his grandma! For more jokes like this, see your local internet provider. Following on is the Kirby design Parademon, a winged devil looking fellow who acts as cannon fodder for Apocalypse. Think Stormtroopers, only squatter, and redder. One of the more unconventional figures in the line, the Parademon comes with a 16-page comic to read on his downtime and a yellow ray gun, presumably with Green Lantern's name on it. Oh, and the figure falls over. A lot. And because they got away with using the word thrust at retail once, Kenner figured, hey, let's do it again for old Mantis here. 
I guess Power Pinch sounds a little too underwhelming, but the figure itself sure isn't. Another big boy in the spirit of Brainiac and Darkseid, this guy's height and frightening appearance is more unbridled Kirby creativity for your toy shelf. Smile and say cheese. Big Red Cheese. It's Captain Marvel, a.k.a. Shazam a former Fawcett property bought on the cheap after DC sued the publisher into the ground over similarities between their character and Superman, the captain suffered the additional indignity of losing his last name due to Marvel Comics scooping the copyright. Shazam or Marvel, he seems to be taking it in his stride. Now one of the costliest figures in the line, the captain here is grinning all the way to the bank. And while he's relatively well known today, in 1985, Cyborg was still on the starting line. This wasn't for lack of trying on DC's part. Like Firestorm, Cy was part of that new wave of heroes that slow boiled instead of blowing up, gaining notoriety for their persistence rather than popularity. For all that, this toy is a standout of the line thanks to its back metal paint and swappable weapon arms. Yowza! With his golden skin and purple translucent power action soaring wings, the Golden Pharaoh looks more like a rejected Bowie persona than a superhero, and with good reason. The character was created specifically for the toy line. Why Kenner felt the need to get creative when it had hundreds of pre-existing characters at its fingertips is anyone's guess. Just keep the bronzer away from this guy. He has zero self-control. As a selling point, Cyclotron here has power action cyclo spin, but that's kind of burying the lead. I mean, the guy's flipping face comes off. Not just that, but a bit of chest as well. It's like a faux skin dicky, which is less a superpower and more the name of an alt rock band from the early aughts. Think, faux skin dicky's first album was great, but after that, they totally sold out. The redesign of New God's character, Orion, comes to us courtesy of King Kirby himself, although it's hard to improve on the original. Orion's power is represented here by his head spinning in a plastic drum, a la Mattel's Many Faces figure, although the execution is pretty underwhelming. He comes with nothing. Samurai was a character created by the guys who wrote the Super Friends cartoon, who felt that they needed more characters with bare legs. I'm not sure what this says about the writers, myself as an audience member, or Samurai in general, but hey, nice man bun. Mr. Miracle has power action wrist lock escape, which is the fanciest way yet of saying that his arms go up and down. Remember, you're buying the sizzle, not the steak, folks. Speaking of steak, I'm not sure what they're feeding folks on Apocalypse, but this is one brawny fellow. He's buffer than Superman. Another beloved entry in the third series, classic comic staple, Plastic Man. Created by Jack Cole in 1941, our pliable protagonist appears here with power action stretching neck, which has to take first prize for worst action feature of the line. I know he's meant to be silly, but come on. Better to just stare at his hideous, featureless feet. Mr. Freeze proved to be a great choice for the line. While his action feature was mediocre, his sculpt was sharp and highly detailed. The addition of the translucent plastic helmet gave the figure even more visual punch, suggestive as it was of the villain's own icy nature. Iridescent cloth cords connected the arms to the backpack, furthering the frosty illusion. Going out with a power action rocket launch, Tear was Kenner's reddest figure, and that was saying something. While his facial hair is worth a mention, it was his spring-loaded arm that carried the day, which is strange. The thing looks like it has a lot more punch than Boba Fett's missile ever did. Maybe it was harder to choke on? Imagine being a consumer in that control group. 
Clark Kent was a mail-away figure offered in 1985. While Superman's alter ego may seem like a strange choice for an action figure, it's important to remember the popularity of the first two Superman films. Christopher Reeve's portrayal of the bumbling reporter was fresh in the minds of the consumer, and Kenner hedged their bets by offering this, and not just some crummy repaint. On that subject, Gulliver's Super Amico's Riddler looks suspiciously like another character in the line, right down to his sculpted power ring. Riddle me this, when is a knockoff not a knockoff? when Toy Biz actually issues their own hybrid figure three years later. Actually, Toy Biz reused a number of Kenner molds for their DC Superheroes toy line of 1989. On the international front, El Capitan Rey is a repainted Superman for those south of the border, with what appears to be a Hulk knockoff molded in white for him to beat on. As Johnny would say, weird and wild stuff. Anyone familiar with DC heroes of the era is no stranger to the Hall of Justice. The team's headquarters appeared in the Super Friends cartoon and shows up here as a brightly colored playset. Within the hallowed halls are loads of little gimmicks for the figures to interact with, including a computer monitor, a watchtower, and a jail cell for when the Golden Pharaoh gets out of line. When you're done playing and packs up as a convenient carrying case. Think superhero transportation, and there are few vehicles as iconic as the Batmobile. Here, Kenner goes all out to deliver what is perhaps the best representation to date. The chassis is molded in a moody blue, befitting the Dark Knight, accented by amber windscreens and vac metal hubcaps. With flashing headlights, a working ram, and a capture claw to nab the baddies, this is the line's Cadillac. A step down would be the Supermobile, which is inferior in every way. Its unimposing silhouette is made even less so by the primary colors, but at least it appeared in the comics. The Justice Jogger has no such excuse. And look at the shame on Superman's face. It's well deserved. The Justice Jogger demeans us all. Following on, there was a rather sharp-looking Batcopter, which must have really rubbed Superman's rhubarb. It was later reissued in all black for the 1989 Toy Biz Batman line. And why not? A reissue would actually sell, unlike the Lexor 7 here, another made-up item. Sure, I get it. If Superman has a vehicle, then his arch needs a vehicle, too. Never mind the fact that Superman can fly and Lex is wearing a battle suit that can do the same, let's put him in bumper cars. And if that seems like it's taking the Star Wars formula too far, then check out Calabax Boulder Bomber, a high-tech attack craft that launches rocks. Don't furnish your invading army with Ewok military surplus. Step up your game, Darkseid. The Delta Bomber is another line-specific vehicle, and it's a ridiculous eyesore. Its silly shape and bright colors puts it firmly in Fisher-Price Adventure People territory. Darkseid fares a bit better, but again, the non-threatening design and goofball color scheme sends this one right to the clearance aisle. Publisher DC Comics issued three limited series in support of the line, although Kenner had pulled the plug before the third series had finished. With art by Jack Kirby, among others, the books lack the synergy of the free pack in comics and are largely forgotten today. Saturday morning cartoon Super Friends, the legendary Super Power Show, ran from 1984 to 1985 and featured new characters having adventures alongside the more established heroes. The Super Powers brand was even used to market older cartoons, like Filmation's Batman Superman Hour. I call shenanigans. If audio is more your thing, then you could thrill to these book and tape collections with the sort of high quality acting and production values that you'd expect. Do not attempt to resist us, human. We will only make it more painful for you. There were also activity books for younger fans if you'd managed to resist eating your crayons. 
Mom packed you a lunch, so you don't have to. Although, burnt sienna does sound like it'd make a better dessert than an old bruised apple. To digest your shame, unwind with the Give a Show projector, then wrap it all up by hitting the sack in your Superman-sanctioned pajamas. Ah, all is right with the world. In closing, Superpowers wasn't just a toy line, even though that's what it's best remembered for. Superpowers was a rebranding, a recontextualization of the familiar, a new coat of paint on that sturdy old bike. It was the push that saw DC properties return to many homes after a too long absence, re-establishing the characters and showing there were still stories to be told and money to be made. In just a few years, the Tim Burton Helm Batman film would break box office records, and the sales of its resulting toy line would make superpowers seem like a modest success at best. While it's hard to imagine a world before movies made these characters household names, it's one you don't need a boom tube to return to. Only some toys, and your unfettered imagination. I'm Jason Mink. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this program, please check out the other comics-related content available on this channel. Until next time.